Chris, welcome back to the World XP Podcast. It's been been a little while, but of course we had to get you back on. Last time we talked, we looked like we were getting out of the woods a little bit, and then Joe Rogan got it, and now we're all back into hiding. How you <laughs> doing? True. Good, man. Good. Uh, yeah, it, uh, things took a turn. I mean, I guess I I might end up with a mug at the end of this. <laughs> you might. A your wrong mug. <laughs> yeah, from your brother. Can't get much worse than that, can it? No, it, yeah, it, it digs a little deep, but you get over it. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so Rogan got it, and then uh, and then he got better, and people are seem to be mad about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. I think um, he was on after he got back. He was talking with Tom Segura, and he was like, "Bro, do I have to sue them to sue CNN?" And then that yeah. went that went viral because, of course, it's CNN, and he's talking about suing CNN, which not going to lie, that would be absolute comedy. And I would love to be in that courtroom <laughs> to listen to them talk about, well, he said, he said, I took a horse dewormer and they said I didn't take a horse dewormer. <laughs> like being the judge that had to like hear that case, I would, if I was that judge, I would probably just not be a happy person. Yeah. Right. If, if you're, if he's, if Rogan's not going to offer you at least some DMT to get through it, I don't think you're going to make it. Uh, Joe, do you want some DMT, Rogan? Love it. <laughs> it has to be. I do want to ask you, though. So, the, so when he got it, he posted this video for those who haven't seen it. Basically, he said, uh, I got COVID. I talked to my doctor and he said, I think the words were, we threw the kitchen sink at it. And then mm -hmm. he mentioned uh, a couple of things. He mentioned monoclonal, monoclonal antibody, antibodies. Uh, he mm -hmm. mentioned a drug that we'll call the big eye, because if we say the drug, I don't know, apparently YouTube doesn't like it. So sorry, YouTube, please don't take my channel down. I really love you guys. You guys are the best. Uh, <laughs> Z-Pack and a vitamin drip. I think were those the four main ones? I'm pretty sure. That's what I remember. Yep. Yeah. So the two that people aren't really talking about are z pack and the vitamin drip and i want to just touch mm -hmm. on those real quick so people have a full picture of what he did because he seemed to get better within like less than a week or so so mm -hmm. for those that don't know like myself what is a z pack so a z pack is a basically it's an antibiotic um it's a general purpose antibiotic kind of like a, a um like a penicillin or something like that um, and people tend to prescribe it in sort of broad use. So, it, you know, if you're sort of unsure what somebody has, a Z-Pack is not, um, not typically off the table. Uh, we used to joke at, uh, at UVA that if you went to student health, they would diagnose you with probably mono or pregnancy and give you a Z-Pack either way. That was the, <laughs> like, that was the like kind of the go-to. Um, so, yeah, so it's just a kind of a, a broad spectrum antibiotic. That doesn't... Antibiotics wouldn't necessarily help with the virus, would they? Or is this, or is this just kind of a catch anything that falls through the cracks type deal? Pretty sure that was the approach. I mean, that that's you know when I think when Rogan was saying he was looking for the kitchen sink, he just sort of went after a bunch of stuff that um, you know is reasonably safe, and uh, some of it might work, some of it might not. But given that it's not dangerous, just to go for it. Um, and, you know, he's clearly a, you know, a health nut. So he's already in pretty decent shape. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like that, that helps too. He, um, he did say on that show with Segura that he had that plan ready to go. Like if he got COVID, he was like, this is what I'm doing with it beforehand. So he had it all ready to go, yeah. which I thought was smart. Also, I don't really, most people don't have the resources to to go ahead and do that. So which is kind of unfortunate, but um, the vitamin drip, I feel like that's fairly self-explanatory. Is that yeah, I mean, pretty much what it seems like it is? Yep. Yeah, it's just a, you know, I, I, from his perspective, I think he's using it as like a general health booster, right? You know, I'm going to boost my immune system by eating some oranges and, you know, getting my vitamin C and all my, you know, vitamin D and vitamin A and that kind of thing. Gotcha. And then that leaves us with the last two. 
Shall we go? Which one should which one should we go into first? I I don't. <laughs> we can so, go in. Go ahead. No, you pick. You pick. All right, we'll go into. We'll do the monoclonal antibodies. Is that is that how it's pronounced? Yep. Okay. What are those? So, uh, so antibodies come in two general flavors. Um, and so just as a reminder to the audience, an antibody is a protein. It's shaped like a Y. Um, your body makes them in response to infection, specifically a cell called the B cell makes them. Um, what they do is they float through your bloodstream and then throughout your body. And they're, they have this Y shape and the two, the front end of the Y. So the two uh, top parts of the letter they have what are called antigen binding domains. And what they do is they bind to proteins um, that they're designed to go after, right? So, or, or ones that they've been trained to find. And then the, the stem of the Y is basically a hand holder for the rest of the immune system. Um, and so what they do is they act as a translator between things that your immune system doesn't really know what to do with um, and things that it does know what to do with, right? So it's providing an adapter um, for all of the the untrained cells to go, well, I don't know what that thing is, but I know I'm supposed to grab that handle and deal with anything that's bound on the other end of it. Um, and so there's the two flavors of them are monoclonal and polyclonal. And what that's referring to is how many different types of antibodies are in the mix, right? So if you have a jar with only one type of antibody, so it's the same antibody over and over and over and over and over again, those are monoclonal antibodies, right? One clone mm -hmm. um, versus if you have a bunch of different types of antibodies in that jar, then it's polyclonal, right? Poly being multi-clones. Um, so they can all be targeting the same thing, but they're not exactly the same protein. So that's what the, the monoclonal antibody is one that was made in a lab. And they said, look, this protein is great. It's perfect. It's what we wanted to do. So we made 87 million copies of it and we'll inject it into you. Uh, so for him, is this, uh, remind, is the spike protein, is that the one that the COVID, the virus makes? Mm -hmm. So these, these antibodies would be the ones that would find those spike proteins. Is that? Yep. Gotcha. So they just took a bunch of them and then just injected it into him pretty much. Yep. And it, it's people use it as a way to sort of, um, to sort of cheat immunity. Actually, babies use this, this approach, mm. um, which is interesting too. So when they're too young to have their fully fleshed out immune system, um, they borrow antibodies from their mother, right? So when they drink milk, they'll get antibodies from the mom that are specific for a bunch of different diseases. And so the way that this works is you're basically jump starting the immune system. So your, your immune system, typically when it functions normally, will make its own antibodies, right? So the, the way that the your immune system responds is it sees something it doesn't like. It trains a bunch of B cells. It takes a little time to train them. Once they're all trained and they found the antibody format that they like, you know, they made something that sticks to the target. Um, they make a bunch of it and flush it out into your blood. Um, and so what monoclonal antibody therapy does is it saves you that five to seven days where you're normally making those antibodies and just says, let's just jump ahead to the part where you already have them. Um, mm. and, you know, that gets you to the part where you're already clearing the virus a little bit earlier. Gotcha. So that would help explain the, the five day turnaround for him then rather than like the normal two weeks. -ish. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe, so that, maybe not. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a thing going around Twitter, which I think is actually, it's a decent point, which is the, the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, so I, in Rogan's case, I mean, it's not atypical. Mm -hmm. It's not wildly atypical for somebody just to recover in that timeline. Um, you know, so I had it, right? I got COVID last spring and I had uh, roughly three days of real symptoms and then kind of felt 80% for another couple of days, you know, maybe through a week. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't do any, like I didn't take anything, right? I rested and drank water, and watched movies. Um, that's so, it, yeah, right. So in his case, it's tough to say whether the antibodies or the big eye or the, the drip 
um, or just him being in good health and, you know, kind of getting a lucky roll of the genetic dice. Any of those could have contributed, um, which is why I think he just went for the kitchen sink, right? He just said, well, just throw it all in. We don't know which one's going to stick, but it doesn't matter. Something will. Gotcha. So before we go to the fourth piece of what he mentioned, from our last conversation with uh, Tom and Katie, who is now Dr. Katie, congrats to Mm -hmm. her. Yeah, right. Um, The vaccines were, what exactly did they do? Because it wasn't the same as a normal vaccine where you get Uh, like a dead version of the virus injected into you. This one was, if I remember correctly, was it something to do with the antibodies or was I misunderstanding or is my memory incorrect? No. Yeah. So it, it ends in antibodies. Um, So it's like the end of the story, but the front end that's a little different is um, you have to take a step back and um, kind of imagine how an infection typically works. Right. And so what normally happens in a typical infection is that your body gets, you know, you get injured or something, you breathe something in, um, the virus goes into your system. And what it does is it infects certain individual cells and it instructs those cells. It basically, you know, your cells are little factories that make a bunch of proteins. uh, And it basically does a hostile takeover and says, okay, you're making what I want you to make now right? Like you're not going to do that anymore. You're going to make what I want you to make. And then the cells can kind of send up like sort of subtle SOS signals like, Hey, our factory has been taken over, um, which leads to an immune response. Right. But, but in the meantime, what the virus is doing is it's um, viruses don't have much of in the way of cellular machinery of their own, right? They only have blueprints. They don't have actual factory machinery. Mm -hmm. And so they have to go find a factory that they can take over. Um, And what they do is they start making that factory make their blueprints, which makes more viruses. And then the virus, you know, the cell eventually bursts and releases a bunch of virus um, and starts the whole cycle over, right? All those different viral particles then infect new cells, they take over the factory, they make more virus and around and around you go. Um, What the RNA vaccines did um, was they sort of mimicked that by injecting you with uh, partial blueprints but not the full picture, right? So not enough to make a viral particle, but enough that your cells start making pieces of the virus, specifically the spike protein. Um, And -hmm. your cells then send up an SOS, like they've been infected, right? And they say, hey, this isn't right. Um, And your immune system comes and checks it out. So you basically get something that resembles an infection without the capacity of actually generating, you know, replicating viral particles. Gotcha. So the difference between that and the just the antibodies is that step where the antibodies don't teach your cells to make the antibodies. They just give it to you. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So, all right. I'm sure we'll come back to that later. Let's get to the fourth piece. Yeah. But that's why when, like when you're a kid, right, that's why your mom's immunity doesn't last, right? When you stop you know, when you stop having mm-hmm. breast milk, you no longer borrow those antibodies. You have to, you have to learn to make your own, right? right? So that's why all kids have to go through their own vaccines. Gotcha. Yeah, helpful info for everyone. Right. Something new every day. <laughs> uh, all right. The big <laughs> eye. Yeah. So, so my understanding and I'll say what I do and then you tell me that I'm wrong. So <laughs> sounds good. My understanding is that there are two versions. One is for more animals, livestock, and then the other is for humans. It's mm-hmm. mostly a anti-parasitic drug that the, the human version uh, has been used widely in Africa for river blindness and things of that nature, mm-hmm. other sorts of parasites. Um, but it also seems to have antiviral properties that haven't really been fleshed out yet is that sort Mm -hmm. of a concise ish way to describe it yeah i think so i think that's that kind of defines what's going on with it um full disclosure like we were sort of talking about this beforehand but i don't know what the proposed mechanism of action of how this would have antiviral properties um from my sort of professional expertise 
again, not specifically knowing about this in particular, um, typically these antiviral, um, you know, these viral nucleotides or these kind of inhibitors, they don't work super well. Um, it's hard to get the, the right exposure because you need to give a patient like a ton of it um, to get enough in the body to try and trick the virus. Was this um, one the nucleotide or was that the other one that Trump talked no. about? No. Yeah, that was the other one. Okay. Yeah. Um, Just but want like, to make so sure, the, full disclosure for everyone. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good point. Yeah. So this is the other one we're not allowed to talk. About. Um, I think, are we the hydro one? <laughs> yeah. The other. The other one. Um, but yeah. So I mean, the, the thing is, I, I think, and this is the sign of like when you can tell you've sort of crossed from um, the realm of science into sort of like cult of personality stuff is um, I'm fully comfortable going, I don't know. I mean, I, I would test it. I would test a lot of things. There's a lot of doctors who say it works. Um, they're using it in the clinic. There's a lot of confounding variables in those data too, right? I mean, the vast majority of people recover from COVID. So, you know, when you say I treated a hundred patients and 99 of them got better, uh, those are just the odds, right? You, you, you have to treat you know, assuming you found a difference, let's say you went from the 99 to 100%, right? So giving this drug made everybody better, right? Or even mm -hmm. gave it 80%, you saved 80% of people, right? If you tested it and say, you know, roughly speaking, let's go with a one in a thousand fatality rate, right? If you gave this to 10,000 people, you would have saved eight people which, you know, at that point you're like, is this signal or is this noise? I don't know. Uh, you know, eight people could be a fluke. Yeah. Um, and so to really test it, you know, you're going to need a lot of people in sort of a randomized way. Um, and there's a lot of arguments about it of, of as to whether that's been done correctly or not to this point. Um, but I think it's interesting to watch sort of what I would typically refer to as the talking heads sort of spin this into a thing when I, I'm confused why they have an opinion on it one way or another, right? That's, um, you know, when to make it like something, you know, I, I remember, yeah, with the, with the hydroxy one, I remember, I don't remember who said this though. Somebody said on, on the news, you will die if you take this, right? Like they came out and they said, you will die. Um, we can probably, never mind. I'm not going to say that. Anyways, keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I remember thinking, I mean, you give this to kids. You give it to kids going to third world countries because it's an anti-malarial. You're not going to die. It might not work. That's a different question, right? Like whether it's going to work or not. But no, you're not going to die. It's ridiculous, right? Like it's, it's hyperbole. Yeah. Um, and it's meant to get clicks and sell a story and do all these other things. But it's not science and it's not, I don't know, it's, it's hysteria. So is this the same for the the eye one that it's it's my understanding is that it's perfectly safe like you could take it even if you have yeah. nothing and it's not going to not going to hurt you really at all. Yeah. I don't know if it'll work or not, but um you know if you're taking it with dosing you know recommendations it doesn't seem you know particularly toxic in any way. So one one of the things that you just mentioned is one so I'm Obviously, I'm not at all in your field of expertise. My expertise in this area comes from our previous podcasts and other conversations with you and Tom and uh, Katie. But one of the things that you just mentioned was that that's kind of what the odds were anyways. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't even listening to pros and cons of this uh, in other channels and other news outlets and whatever the case may be, I hadn't even considered that. I hadn't even crossed my, my mind that like everyone's saying it either works or it doesn't, but in reality, no one actually knows because that's what the odds are anyways, because I heard there were several um, like Dr. Pierre Corey is a good example, but there's several mm -hmm. like ER doctors and ICU doctors who, or maybe ICU more than ER, but who have given this and they are very strong proponents of it. Mm -hmm. And so I would wonder why they also don't have the same sort of like, well, this is the odds that they would recover. Is it because the, the patients they give it to are the like the higher risk mm -hmm. ones that they would expect to do worse? And in which case that would change the odds for them, wouldn't it? Definitely. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, they they probably know their population better than me, sort of guessing out of a hat. Sure. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, I think this is the thing. Um, it's hard to say, right? What if they just had a different population than other people? Right. You know, if you're in if you're in Atlanta, do you have a different patient population than if you're in Boston? Or if you're in Baltimore, or if you're in Washington, DC, or you know, like who's coming into your ICU? Are they older? Are they predominantly male, female, you know, these kind of things tend to, to make a difference. Um, and when you're only able to see the one site, again, not, not a reflection on them. It's, you know, they're saving lives in the ER. I'm over here kind of, you know, Monday morning, Monday morning quarterbacking. Sure. Um, but it's hard to remove yourself from the data. Um, I mean, it's why you do your best to blind things. You know, I mean, we, we'll talk about clinical trials kind of later on, but it's why people blind clinical trials is because you don't want to influence things. Um, and you, you know, you, you want to let, you know, you want to trust the design more than sort of your own eyes, right? That, um, so again, I, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It might work. Um, I would, I would want it tested in sort of a rigorous and thorough way. And I, I haven't dug in too deep to see, you know, how thorough it's been. Um, I've heard a couple sources kind of reference that they don't love all of the clinical trials, but then, like you said, there's people on the other side too. Um, so I, I don't know. That's the, the short answer. Yeah. It's more just a curious thing. Why given your sort of thoughts on it, why there's so much uproar on more of the side that's saying it doesn't work but mm -hmm. even the side that says it does work they're very strong like strongly behind it and i could imagine from the people that are behind it it's like we've noticed this saving lives we want to save more lives it's a fairly mm -hmm. easy easy one to sort of understand but from the other side i don't really want to dive too much into this because it's, i think it'll be very easy to get caught in a rabbit hole of well, it's generic and there's no profit to be made and all these other things sure. that may or may not be true or kind of true or whatever the case yeah. may be is. But one, from a purely like, if you have a doctor come on and say, no, this is not going to work. It's like horse dewormer. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that's a bit disingenuous. Agreed. Like just, just based off a of Google search, you could figure out that it's been one of the most widely used drugs and humans yeah so i don't want a nobel prize for it yeah i think either the company or whoever the guy that invented it did i think it was yeah. i want to say 24 14 15 something like that yeah um but just with a quick google search you can you can figure that out and so i'm not a doctor i know nothing about medical anything i know nothing about drugs yeah but like even i know that like i like so i don't understand the rationale for no, this definitely doesn't work. Don't mm -hmm. take it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's an aspect of this too that's um, that sort of leftover remnants of legacy media that's trying to figure out how to deal with the fact. So or you said something interesting, which was with a quick Google search. I know that's not true, right? Well, but I think Google, so I would, let me rephrase that. Not all things on the internet are true. However, comma, like, for example, the Nobel Prize thing, like, mm -hmm. if somebody faked that on the internet, I would be, impressive. be uh, yeah, that would be impressive. So just to sort of clarify, there are things like that, that you can find with a quick Google search that you would know, and it's for the use in humans. So like, mm -hmm. you know what, I'm going to Google it right now. <laughs> yeah. Because, That's because is my camera still up? Hopefully. Yeah, you're still there. Okay. Uh, you need so this to is, Jamie. So this is from sciencedirect.com. Mm -hmm. It says, Big Eye is a multifaceted drug of Nobel Prize honored distinction with indicated efficacy against the new global scourge, COVID. And in 2015, Nobel Committee for Physiology or Medicine and its only award for treatments of infectious diseases since six dec decades prior honored the discovery of big eye. 
So mm-hmm. I would like, so I would say, right, with that Google search, I would say the probability that it is true from the standpoint of like me doing a Google search and saying the information is true. Mm-hmm. I would say the probability change my mind, right? I, like if it's not true, fine. But the probability that it's true, I would say is very high. So yeah, that's when I say quick Google search, that'll be my clarification. Sure. No, I agree with everything you said. I was actually going a totally different way oh, okay. with that, <laughs> but I, I agree. No, my, my point being, I think the average person 20 years ago, obviously with the advent of Google being a caveat, an asterisk to the statement, sure. but the average person 20 years ago did not pull out their encyclopedia and double check what the nightly news told them. Right. No, that's they just too much said, work. Correct. And even today, to do a quick Google search and go, hey, what's the wiki on that thing look like? Um, is is too much work, right? And so instead, you just go, well, what so and so say? Oh, it's horse dewormer. Okay, well then I'm not going to look at it anymore, right? Like, so let let's do one thing too. Let's take that off the table. If you're getting drugs from a vet, you're making a mistake. That's don't don't take drugs from your vet, right? Go to a doc. You'll find a doctor. They'll prescribe yeah. things to you correctly. If you don't like your doctor get another doctor. That's fine. Don't go to a vet. So let's take that off the table. But the fact that that, that is brought forward as like a, hey, right? It's the, it's the straw man, right? Instead of the steel man, it's the straw man. Let's take the dumbest possible argument and put this front and center and pretend it's the only argument. And then we can knock it down and then on we go, right? But it's, it's sad to me that that is, I, I feel like some of these things are sort of the throes of a media complex that's realizing that it's losing like eyeballs, yeah. right? There's people going, ah, what are you even talking about over there? Um, and, you know, like, I mean, we've all, we've all seen the, like the figures with the media, you know, media numbers going down and viewership decreasing on sort of these big cable news programs. Um, and so I think they panic, right? And they're looking for things to grab eyeballs. Yeah, it's just... It's just nobody, like, nobody was like, hey, this is very easily uh, disproven. And within, like, 15 seconds, maybe we shouldn't say this. Like, I don't think they expect their audience to check. I really don't. I don't think, I, I, you know. I don't know. But even, and then the other thing that, that right, so they want to say it's that. But then mm-hmm. he gets better. So, I don't know. How dare he? Yeah, this is, it's, it's just, and for less less from like the media perspective, like I understand the media is losing clicks and stuff, but like you'll see, like there will be doctors who will go on those shows and mm-hmm. basically validate what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Sure, and that's the part I don't understand. It's like you're not a media person. You're like, well, mm-hmm. unless they are, but. That's the part that I don't understand, really. Yeah. I mean, I think to give them the benefit of the doubt, they might believe it just as strongly, right? And maybe, I, I mean, I know this, right? I run into lots of scientists who have lots of opinions on things that they haven't researched. Not really. Yeah. Right? They just, they took their talking point and they ran with it, you know? And I, um, I find that kind of thing interesting, right? So I, I find it interesting that I feel... Like, so it, it, people in sort of the immune oncology space, I think will do two things simultaneously, which is sort of an amazing mind switch for me, mm-hmm. where on the one hand, they'll go, I mean, there's been a couple reports that like most biology papers are not reproducible, right? So you, you look at them and you go, okay, they did X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to try and do X, Y, and Z, and I can't get it to work, right? So like, there's that finding that I think any biologist would say, yeah, that's out there, that a large majority of publications, you know, maybe not for fraud, maybe they had a different temperature or a different reagent or a different thing they just forgot to mention, like just, but the fact of the matter is I can't take their paper and recreate it in my own lab. Um, And then at the same time, then they'll turn around and go, well, the science has decided X, Y, or Z. And you go, well, you mean all the publications that in your own field you don't always trust those ones, right? Like, I, you know, I, I find, yeah. I run into that a lot where people will say like, well, um, you know, I, I think, 
yeah, like the, they'll they'll pick up an opinion of a scientific community and then they'll add their moniker to it, right? So like I'm Dr. Nurshall PhD, but I'm an immunologist, right? So when I come out and I go, listen, this thing about that zebra fish is really real. I, I have a little bit of expertise because yeah. I know how to read literature, but I, I don't, it's not my field. I, I don't know, right? I, I read a little bit and I kind of ran with it, but I'm not, you know, my, but I'm given that moniker of expertise. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And that, to me, like when we were, when I was in school, like growing up, the science, you were taught to like question things. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the other, the other side of this piece where I'm not a scientist, but my mm-hmm. understanding of science is the point of it is to find new things. Mm-hmm. So you should be questioning stuff. And so that's, that's why I don't understand this. Uh, like, this is the science. Like Fauci said, if you question me, you're questioning the science. Like, that's not how science works. Yeah. Or like, yeah. I'm not a scientist. So what do I know? And I ran into this as well. I was watching, uh, I was talking to Jason, um, episode 36, maybe mm-hmm. about this documentary called the game changers. And basically what it, it is, it's like, it's a big uh, advocate of plant-based diets. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he went, uh, the guy that, oh, his name, I don't remember his name. The guy that basically funded it or like produced it went on Rogan uh, with another guy who's, whose name also escapes me. And they basically kind of had this debate about the like where you get protein sources from and this and that. And the plant-based guy kept saying the scientific consensus is mm-hmm. blank. When in reality, he could have done the scientific consensus based on the research that he looked at could have been that way but also especially with diet it's like whatever works for you right because i know people who have gone full carnivore diet and it's helped them with autoimmune disease or it's helped them with arthritis or it's helped them arthritis is an auto autoimmune disease but that's not Mm plant-based and it clearly works for them so yeah kind of going back to what we were talking about about like consensus it's like Mm -hmm. i don't know i'm kind of just like dumbfounded a little bit by what's going on it's like it doesn't seem like there's science anymore and from a person who's not in the scientific community mm-hmm. at all like is that like is that sort of your feeling as well with it like what's your sort of like within obviously don't you know have the name names or whatever but sure yeah, within yeah. within your general sciencey thing that you do over there like what like what is it is it still how you grew up doing it or is it changed? I mean, it, it, um, it is when you get into the actual process of science, right? So it, it kind of gets back to my earlier comment, right? When I think when most of those people are in their lab doing their thing, they're curious. Um, but at some point your incentives start to switch and you start to need to defend a narrative rather than defend the science, right? I I think science and in particular scientific publishing has a real issue that they haven't grappled with, um, which is you can't progress your career unless you start to publish positive data, right? So if I, I cannot get promotions or academic positions or um, a specific, I mean, mostly in in the academic realm, right? Because in in the industry, um, there's not as much on the publishing front. Right. Um, it, industry has its own incentive issues, but the, I think there's never going to be a perfect system. Um, but in the academic realm, right, if I do a bunch of experiments that don't work, right, so I try 52 things, none of them work, I have nowhere that I can publish that data, right? There's nowhere that I can go and say, here's the stuff I did that didn't work. And because of that, somebody else, somewhere else is going to try and publish that, right? They're going to try and do it again because there's so no why, why is that the case is it because there's too many like articles that are already going through or like what i feel like that would be useful information i think most scientists would agree that it is but it's boring to read right well, i did a bunch me, of things they didn't me, work it's all boring so <laughs> yeah fair enough um yeah no but there's this there's this thing that you have to have a game changer or a paradigm shifting paper to get a position and the problem is that there's not enough but, you know, like by definition, there's not that many paradigm shifting papers, right? Otherwise they wouldn't, right? Like to be paradigm shifting, you have to really shake something up. And so there's an incentive 
to sort of fiddle around the edges to kind of switch some, you know, like, again, not to like outright lie, but to, you know, maybe I'm not going to do that experiment because I don't think it's going to turn out the way I want it to. Um, or, you know, I'm going to show it as fold change rather than as a percent, right? So like, let's say I, I do an experiment and I go from 1% of my cells are positive to 5% of them are positive, right? If I present that to people and say, look, Eric, I went one to 5% on pretty much anything. Most people will go, so you went from one to five. I don't who cares, right? It's still not that many. Yeah. But if I come to you and I say, Eric, I have a 500% increase or Eric, I increased the expression of this protein five times. Oh, okay. Well, now that's yeah. something, right? So like there's a spin on it that you need. And, and to be fair to the people in the middle of it, right? I mean, if you're a postdoc who's trying to get a position somewhere, I you don't need this paper. All. I right, like I mean, yeah. that's how I would run so my old. own science. That's how I. That's how I would do my projects in school. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's like, oh, this seems like I could fudge this and this. Not fudge if I could, you know, make this sound better than it is because I forgot to do the work until the day before. Not that postdocs <laughs> would forget to do the work, but <laughs> point still stands. Well, maybe they yeah. do. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in postdoc. I have no room to talk on that. Yeah, <sighs> but no, Anyways, I mean, yeah, yeah. they like their life's on hold, right? They're paid like under 50 grand a year they have a phd and they can't they work 60 70 hours a week right and they i mean you you know they can't raise a family they can't do you know you can't progress until you get out of this trap and so everything else in your life is saying you got to get out of this and at some point you just start to go okay i got my paper here it is um yeah and so i i think that yeah that's a real issue with sort of the reproducibility of science is but then, but then, like I said, so that that's the the framework for scientific consensus, right? Is that system? Um, so I think anytime somebody is leaning on scientific consensus rather than explaining the data, that should be a red flag, right? It's an appeal to authority argument that they may they may not even understand the underlying data. They might not know the underlying data. They're just saying so and so said it. Right. And I mean, again, you can go both ways on this one. You can, I mean, it's ironically, it's the same thing that you would turn around, you know, and say, well, you're just saying that because, you know, Donald Trump told you to do it, or you're just saying that because Joe Biden said it. Yeah. A lot of people are. That's, yeah. that is the rationale is so and so said it. I just, I wish people would think. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, I don't, I said something in the first or second episode that you texted me about last summer, something like along the lines of, I don't think the, the free market should touch academia or science or something like that. Mm -hmm. You texted me about it because you said you had thoughts on it. And I feel like we're getting to a point where we can sort of explore that. We didn't get a chance to do so in the first one because it was more a, a panel and we're going over basics of how the immune system works and all sorts of stuff. And then last time sure. was basics of COVID. So I want to get on, I want to touch on that a little bit because my, your dis, uh, description of why science papers are the way they are, especially with like in the postdoc academic side, mm -hmm. that sort of reasoning to me would say there's an incentive other than academics or science that shouldn't be there. And I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and given, right. So like the universities, that's sort of their, their job, or at least in my mind, right. The graduate programs is like the research and the, like the cutting edge of what you're doing. And so you shouldn't really care about, a paradigm shifting paper mm -hmm. not completely obviously that'd be super cool and obviously you want that but sure you shouldn't have an incentive to not publish things that other people would find useful as boring as it may be because right? mm -hmm. you don't want people to repeat the same things because nobody wanted to publish that because it wasn't cool enough to publish like that's not what you want like from yeah. somebody on the outside looking at it like 
I think you describe the relationship as we can have universities do the stuff that we don't really think you speaking you from industry. Sure. We can have the universities do stuff that we are not so sure that it'll work because they get grant money and we have to turn a profit to keep our business going and they don't. Sure. So, but it seems like that's not really the same now or like in some fields, it seems like those universities also don't, they want to do the things that will work so they continue to get the grant money. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is a problem, but also I'm not in that world. So I don't really know, but that, that was kind of my reasoning for why I said that in whatever episode it was one, maybe I think episode one, Um, but that was my reasoning for why. So thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, I think you're not wrong. So, so let's take a step back, right? So the incentives on the, I think the fundamental issue with sort of the academia side of things is that it's designed um, for something other than human beings, right? Like, I mean, human beings have egos and they have, they want respect and they want social status and they want to be liked and they want to be, you know, they want people to think they're smart. Um, And all of that plays into this sort of prestige thing right? That you, you know, you get the big paper, which means you get the big grant, which means people notice you at, at conferences, you get to give talks. Um, so like that, you know, and at this point, I'm sort of being very negative on academia. So stay with me for a second. I'll come back to the other side. Well, it's, um, a, it's a human nature thing. I, like, yeah, you can't, you can never get away from that. And no matter what you're talking about, it just is there. Right. So on the flip side, right, I mean, the, the, the best part of academia and the thing, you know, the thing that I think people, you know, rightfully attribute to the academic side is the idea of pure investigation, right? You know, unadulterated, untouched investigation for investigation's sake, right? You know, it's hard for me as an industry scientist, you know, if I can't link sort of what I want to look into directly to you know, one or two jumps away towards a, you know, some kind of clinical gain or something for one of our programs. Um, you know, it's a no, right? It's just, it's too speculative, right? I'm, I'm, as a small biotech, I'm unlikely to go fishing, right? Maybe some of the bigger ones will kind of take some of these bigger data sets where they're like, let's just collect 100 patients and see what we find. Um, but, you know, that, that is something that academia does and does well is, these kind of, you know, big investigations into unknown territory, right? And that, um, that is something that would be, that is hard to pull off on the industry side of things. Um, on the flip side, you know, academia has, is a small world, right? You know, we're talking about, you know, a handful of people, you know, it, between universities, there's sort of a handful of people who start to show up on all the same boards and they're in charge of all the same conferences and they, you know, they control a lot of the grant money and then they train people who then take over their spots, right? So like now you have kind of acolytes and, you know, disciples of these original couple people that have taken over and they control the funds um, and they control the grant money, right? Because the way the grant process works is that you, generally speaking, this is, you know, this is not true for all grant su- submission scenarios, but um, your grant goes to a review committee, right? Who's made up of, you know, people like you. It's other, you know, other scientists who come in and they'll read them and score them. Um, but it's hard to separate your own ego, right? So you see something that slides across your desk. It's, a, you know, like, let's say you spent 20 years, right? You're, you know, you spent 20 years working on this drug that's gonna, that you think is the thing, right? It's this protein is gonna really fix, I don't know, river blindness, right? (laughs) And you come up with your thing and this is it. And then something slides across your desk and it says, this drug doesn't work, I've got a better one, right? It's hard to remove yourself from that equation and go, maybe they're right. Like, let me me assess their data, right? Let, Let me go neutral here. I'm gonna see what they've got. Maybe they do have a better drug than me. Um, and not just immediately snap into defensive mode and go, no, this one's wrong. Here's why it's wrong, right? Like to read it a lot more harshly because it contradicts something you believe. Um, so, you know, for example, I had one, I had one reviewer one, I submitted a paper, right? And I had one reviewer come back one time with one of my figures. And he just said, his response was, this is, this is a quote. The response was, 
the figure can't look like that. That's impossible. And I, like, I wrote back to the editor. I was like, what do you want me to do with this? How do I respond to, you didn't give me a critique. You didn't say I'm missing a control or you don't like how I did the experiment or uh, it looks a little funny, add some more point, right? Like, you didn't give me anything I can fix. You just said that data is impossible, the end. Um, so it's, you not know, like, like, it's not like you made it up though. No, so, I mean, I had like the raw files. So then, so, but you would hope, you would hope that people in those positions, right? The people that want to be in academia would be the ones that are the curious, like science for science sake type people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people like that. I, I just don't know that they, um, I, I think in any field, the people who end up sort of wielding the power are sort of the same type of person, right? They're just in a different field. They're interested in that sort of respect and prestige and um, they go hunting for it, right? And that, you know, that, I don't know that that necessarily jives with somebody who's super open to going, I don't know, but let's try it. Um, so I, I think that's a, a fundamental issue with that. I mean, to be fair though, like I said, I mean, industry has its own issues. Right. I mean, it's, oh, of course, yeah. it's, it's profit driven. There's no way around that. Right. Uh, there's, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of that in the COVID realm, right. Of, you know, we're seeing the CEOs of Moderna and Pfizer come out and say, we need boosters. And I'm seeing a surprisingly few number of people go, now, wait a second, <laughs> you make them. And that would make you very rich. Like not to say that there's nothing there, but maybe you shouldn't be the spokesperson, yeah. right? Like, you know, if Apple comes out and says, we need more iPhones, everybody needs an iPhone. We should mandate iPhones. Everybody would go, excuse me? Yeah, <laughs> like, well, they did change their charger. So everybody had to buy new ones. So, right, <laughs> right. like, you know, that's, that profit motive is underlying actions. And so I think it's right to question industry actions. For, from that perspective, right? Like, are you doing this because you think it's um, it, it's good for patients or is it good for the bottom line? I think it's a fair question to ask. Yeah. No, all, all totally valid points. I don't mean to say that everyone in academia is like that. Because again, I have no idea because I'm, I'm not in it mm -hmm. at all. Um, I do get the feeling, though, that those people that you mentioned that sort of like hunt for that prestige and power, that sort of thing, are regardless of industry, academia, politics, whatever the case maybe is, those are the exact people that you don't want to have that sort of thing, usually. Yeah. So, but it's hard because the people that are really good at what they do that just want to do it, that have no interest in running things. Mm-hmm. They have no interest in running things, so you can't make them do it. Right. So then the people that are left are the ones that want to do it, which are the ones that you don't want to do it, but there's nobody else to do it. So it's really, right. it's, it's, it's a catch-22 yeah. there. It is really, uh, humans, yeah. the human experience yeah, right. is such a wild thing in, in that way, like all sorts of contradictions and catch-22s and conundrums that yeah. don't really see, like philosophers have spent years and thousands of years trying to figure out and we're still here like, Yep, you got nothing. <laughs> it's true, right? All these uh, systems work really well until you plug humans into them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seems like a common denominator. Uh. <laughs> well, it, it's something that I, I think is an interesting, it's an interesting study. You know, as like a college kid, I was never really into philosophy. I mm -hmm. thought it was kind of like, okay, whatever, right? I was like a, a science nerd through and through. Um, but now I sort of see it from a, you know, from a systems design perspective of, of saying, look, you're working with a particular tool. It has particular characteristics, right? You're, you're putting, you're using people. People generally do certain things. They have certain drives. You know, if you don't correct for that, you're going to be in a bad place. That's. Yeah. That was one of the things in, in one of my old jobs. It was always like, we have to make this thing Marine proof. Like Marine Corps proof. Uh huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that's to dive slightly into politics. That was that's the reason why the way the Constitution is written, I think, is so brilliant because it takes into account that people are idiots. Mm -hmm. 
maybe not to the perfect extent, but more than most other places, I think probably every other country on, on earth, um, mm-hmm. I would say I've not gone and read all their constitutions. So nobody come at me in the comments like, did you read Liechtenstein's constitution? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't do that. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe if they link with some research you could you could look it up you never know you know what if you've got link if you've got Liechtenstein's constitution put it in the comments <laughs> uh, but i think that one of the other things you mentioned is a good segue and that's the boosters for the vaccines so we've sure. seen so we've seen some breakthrough cases um the last i don't know a couple months mm-hmm. people saying coming out saying well the I think Pfizer is only effective for six months or something like mm-hmm. that. So you're going to need a booster. And I think in Israel, I want to say that you're now no longer vaccinated. If you've only got two shots, you have to have, have yep. got the third one to be considered fully vaccinated. The breakthrough cases. So can you sort of describe what those are and why potentially they could be happening and then sure. if they continue to happen, what is even the point of the booster at that point? Sure. So the, yeah, let's take um, let's take the breakthrough thing first, right? So I do think, so I pulled for, for audio viewers, you're going to have to listen to some numbers. I apologize. But I pulled a crib sheet because I was curious what the CDC said as of September 7th. Send right? me um, a picture of that and we can put the screenshot on the screen. As, All right, cool. as we go through editing and stuff. Beautiful. I'll make it a little bit cleaner, but <laughs> it, it just pulled these numbers from the, so the CDC publishes this thing called the um, mortality and morbidity write up, right? And they publish it every so often. It might be weekly, um, but they published one as of September 7th, right? And what they did was they went through the numbers of, um, you know, vaccinated and unvaccinated people in, in different conditions. Um, but I think a lot of this is actually a numbers misunderstanding um, by the public, right? So I think people are bad at numbers generally, right? And um, they don't know how to correct for them generally, right? I think um, that's really the only reason I get paid is because I can correct for those things. Um, And it takes a certain eye. So the like, so for example, right, let's, let's take the initial claims, right? So that, that Moderna or any of the, let's just take one of the vaccines is 95% effective, right? Um, at preventing fatality, right? In that scenario, if there were a, so the, what they're defining there is that if people were unvaccinated, you know, to give the numbers to it. So let's say if, or if people were unprotected, right? In a given population, 100,000 people would die, right? But if we used this treatment, only 5,000 people would die, right? That's the 95% reduction. Um, It's not saying that it's 95% of the time. It's 95% of the time when this event occurred, it will not occur, right? So when we look at these breakthrough cases, right, and we look in a country of 330 million people, Right, with then we say it has a 95% effectiveness. Um, that leaves 5%, right? Which is 15 million people. It's a lot of people, right? So yeah. if you start to kind of roll up the numbers and go, oh, okay, you know, like so if you start to report, you go, there were a million breakthrough cases. You go, well, I mean, I sort of expected 15 million, so it's actually good. Um, but people aren't correcting for that. Right, they're not. They're not going. They expected it to be zero, but there's a lot of people mentioned at all. Yeah, there's a lot of people, right? So, like, so then I went through and I did. This is where this back of the envelope math comes in, right? So now, with that groundwork, let's dig into this a little bit. So the the CDC reported over 13 areas um, the COVID cases between April and July, right? And the reason that they chose that timeline is that that's the timeline where delta goes from 1% of the of the like of the tested genome to over 90%, right? So that's the window where delta appears. Um, and they said, okay, if we split it down the middle, we can figure out, you know, what are what's the efficacy of the vaccines in the pre-delta, so under 50% delta range versus the post-delta month, right? So There's some issues the the April July time frame in half because 
and April it was basically no Delta, and in July it was pretty much all Delta. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Um, so let's just take the top numbers at first, right? So they say in that timeline, in these areas, these 13 areas that they looked at, there were 570,000 cases of COVID among unvaccinated people, right? Okay. So if there's 570 cases, 570,000, right? And the drug is 95% effective, right? That means you have a 95% reduction of the 580,000, which brings you to, you know, roughly 50,000 ballpark, right? It's a 90% less, yeah. reduction. Yeah. So the actual number of vaccinated people who were a case was 46,000. So that's about right. right. It's about right. It's 91%, right? Um, in terms of hospitalizations, right? So they said the unvaccinated made up 35,000 um, unvaccinated, or sorry, uh, hospitalizations during that timeline. 90% uh, reduction is 3.5 thousand, right? Three and a half thousand. Uh, 3,000 vaccinated people. Also about hospital. right. About right, right? Uh, in that timeline, 6,000 unvaccinated people died, right? 616 vaccinated people died, right? 90% reduction. And this is for the whole three months or this is, yeah. four months? Or, yeah. Yep. And, and note, I mean, this is specifically in these 13 places where they had enough data. That was, right. the, you know. Um, but those are big enough numbers that you would say it's paints a good picture. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think it surprised a lot of people when you came out and said there were 46,000 vaccinated COVID cases, right? That people went, whoa, 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 wait, that's not what we signed up for. Um, but it's still, it is actually reflective of what the vaccines originally said. People just didn't translate it to the full population. Gotcha. Right. Um, and so, I mean, to be fair now, so the FDA is now in an interesting spot. So there's two points that need to be made on these numbers, right? Um, Number one is the pre versus post Delta, right? So um, the, the initial response to these numbers that I can hear people already saying is, but what about Delta, right? Because these numbers include both pre and post Delta. So they break it down between pre and post Delta, right? So they say their pre Delta case prevention rate was 91%. The post Delta in that second window, right? Just mm -hmm. looking at that month, those months in particular uh, was 78%. Right. So it is a 10% drop mm -hmm. in terms of getting PCR positive swaps. Right. Uh, but when is you look at hospital drop in what exactly? Just cases. Right. So total so cases. From so this from it being vaccinated versus unvaccinated, the number. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the, sorry. only 78% are of the cases were vaccinated, were. Oh, no, sorry. no, I gave you 70, that. Wrong. 78 percent of the cases were unvaccinated versus the ninety-one in the first. No, no, no sorry, I got it backwards. Time? So okay. these, this is vaccine efficacy. Okay. In pre-delta versus post-delta. Okay. Right. So this is just looking at that difference between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Right. How mm -hmm. we got to those those ninety percent numbers. So they did that, and now I'm just giving you the like the ninety percent numbers. Right. Okay. So we said the the pre-delta case efficacy of the vaccine was ninety-one percent right? The post-Delta efficacy on, in terms of just PCR positive swaps, right? Nothing else was 78%. So it's a, the vaccines were roughly 10% less protective in terms of preventing a PCR positive swap okay. than before. They're still 80% effective. Right. So, you know, your typical flu vaccine is 50% or under effective. So to give you an idea, we're still well above what would be typically expected. Um, but where the thing actually, where this actually gets interesting is then you go deeper, right? Because at the end of the day, um, I'm not as concerned about cases as I am about hospitalizations and deaths, right? Sure. You know, if you recover, then that's okay. You had, you know, you got sick and you got better. So in terms of hospitalizations, right? We said it was 91% overall, right? The vaccine was, or the vaccines were 91% effective. Pre-Delta, it was 92%. Post-Delta, it was 90%. For hospitalizations? Mm -hmm. So well within the range of just a little bit of noise. So, it, you know, in terms of preventing hospitalizations, there doesn't seem to be a Delta drop um, at this time. There is a little bit one with the cases. And then when you go to deaths, it's the same sort of story, right? So pre-Delta, 94% effective at preventing death. 
post Delta, 91% effective at preventing death. So um, in terms of preventing severe disease and death, the vaccines still seem very efficacious at this point, um, at least up through well, September. Good. Yeah. So the other thing that is interesting to me that it's not more widely reported is the demographics of the breakthrough cases, right? So let me ask you, who do you think is more likely to be, if you had to pick somebody, you know, kind of age, health status, who's going to be a breakthrough case and who's not, right? Older and not great health. Spot on. Yep. So uh, according to the CDC, again, right? So this is the September 7th data again. Um, they said in the United States, there were 2,675 people who were vaccinated who died of COVID, right? So 2,600 total um, up to September 7th. 90% of them were older than 65. Yeah, which is kind of uh, as you'd expect, I would think. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, as unfortunate as, as that is. So just real quick, because I don't want to spend too much time on the numbers. Sure. Um, so if... So the efficacy stays right for cases it's lower, but for the for hospitalizations and deaths, which is the things that we really care about, they're about the same. So for mm -hmm. why then do we need boosters? Like what is is mm. the reasoning, or is well, there none? So it's interesting, right? So the FDA is having a little bit of a, a tiff over this, right? So a couple of people resigned, right? Philip Krauss and Marion Gruber, so the director and the directory, uh, the the deputy director, uh, left. You know, some of the reporting is that they did not like that they were getting pressure from the White House to approve boosters, and that they didn't like that the CDC was overstepping bounds that belong, in their mind, to the FDA, right, as a, as a drug approval process. Um, and they didn't like that they were getting pressed for boosters without what they considered to be sufficient data. Um, so that's, you know, that's the question, and the question that really needs to be asked, and the FDA is, you know, in the middle of as of today, they just released some documents. Um, it seems that they're kind of on the fence as to where they stand with boosters, um, but they have a tough job, right? Because they, they need to prove to themselves that the benefits outweighs the harms of a third shot. Um, and this isn't even a discussion yet, uh, but I mean, we should touch on it, of, of vaccine equity around the world. Um, you know, is there something to the United States, you know, healthy, wealthy people getting three shots before a lot of the world gets one, you know, there's something there. Yeah. Um, but the FDA needs to, needs to really assess these data. And the reason is the benefits of the shots go down as you get more shots. Right. Right. So that's the same you know, with antibiotics. If you take the same one, then the bacteria knows how to fight it. Right. Same sort of same idea. Similar, but, but a little different. Only in the sense that it's not the vaccine losing efficacy, it's that you're losing space to get better, right? So, okay, um, disregard what I said then. <laughs> well, well, here's why because I don't want people to take it as um, getting more vaccine is helping out the virus. Like, that's not, the, that's not the mechanism by which this works. What happens is when you get your first shot, right? So, you get your first shot, a lot of the data suggested you get 80% of the protection out of one shot, right? So, the first shot you get, you get 80% of the, the positive, uh, and you get minimal side effects, right? Because you don't really have an immune response to the first shot, mm -hmm. typically. Second shot, you get another 10%, you're now going to start to get some side effects, right? So the, the risk to reward ratio is starting to shift. You know, and as we said now, the vaccines on two shots are at 92% effective. I don't know how many, in terms of preventing hospitalization and death, I don't know how many more percentage points you can get. Um, I don't, yeah. you're never going to protect hundred percent of people. It's, it's, you can't, you know, death is a part of life. Um, I suppose you could try to get that case rate up a little bit. You could try to get it up a couple percentage points, but then we really need to ask ourselves, what are we trying to, you know, what are, what's our end game here? Yeah. Right. You know, are we trying to prevent people from getting the common cold? Are we trying to prevent them from getting you know, mildly sick and recovering, you know, what are we trying to do? We, we've successfully 
prevented a lot of hospitalization and death. And I don't know that a third shot's going to boost that much more. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it would. There's only so, so high you can go with preventative like measures and then people are people. So you can, at the end of the day, people react to different things differently. Mm -hmm. Some people are allergic to some things, not allergic to other things. Some people react to different diets, different ways. Like everyone's body is different. So yeah, there's only so much you can do really in, in that perspective, but touching on the FDA. So the Pfizer was approved by the FDA a month ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. But for somebody like me who, right. Like, it was available before. It's still available now. Mm -hmm. What it wasn't approved before. Well, obviously, because it just got approved, but what is, yep. what's the difference? What's the mechanism there? How does that fit together? And then the other Moderna and Johnson and Johnson still are not approved, but they're still available. So yeah. how does that kind of work itself out from the FDA approval process? Sure. Side of so things. The, yeah. So the FDA has, um, a reasonably strict set of rules for what it will approve. And some of them are kind of hardlined into the code, right? And so one of them that is in particular um, a sticking point for an emergency is you have to have enough follow-up data. So you have, to, you have to give the drug and then wait long enough for something to develop if it was going to develop. Um, and so in some certain scenarios, like in a pandemic, um, the FDA will say, listen, this looks reasonably safe on the upfront end. It seems to have overwhelming evidence of benefits. Um, so we're gonna pr approve this under emergency use authorization, right? We're gonna let you use it um, under the auspice or under the, the agreement that you're gonna come back with more data later on, right? And then we're gonna really assess whether it should get full approval or not. Um, because part of it is they wanna give it enough time, the data enough time to mature before they do anything. Um, and so some of this stuff with the difference between Pfizer being approved or Moderna being approved at this point is timelines, right? Like it's mm -hmm. just when they sit, they got their paperwork together and they started their trial and they have enough patients that have had the drug long enough. Um, so part of that's just the clock ticking out, you know, they're not allowed to be assessed before a certain date. Um, it also means, I mean, it does, you do also give additional safety data at the, you know, at the approval process. So they, you know, Pfizer submitted um, cumulative safety data from all of their trials over, you know, with extensive six to nine month follow-up times, um, as opposed to in their initial thing where they said, look, we've got two months and you said you wanted two months, right? So here's two months of safety data. Um, here's the efficacy data, right? I mean, if you'll remember these early approvals, you know, they saw a difference of like a hundred people Right. It was, you know, like it was like a hundred people didn't get it. And they were like, you're good. Start giving it to people. Yeah. Um, but it was because the signal was so overwhelmingly large in the benefits side and small enough on the safety side that they said, just start giving it out um, and we're going to keep assessing it. So th that's pretty much what's going on. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. The other thing real quick, before we get to your book, because you did mention clinical trials. So I want to get there. Mm -hmm. But so if the vaccine, given the number that you've laid out, the 90% mm -hmm. uh, efficacy against hospitalizations and deaths, I don't understand the rhetoric coming out of, I'll say politicians saying like, we need to do more to protect vaccinated people. Like, isn't that, that's what the vaccine was for. So I don't understand then mm -hmm. why you would need to mandate it. And then if it's, if you do need to protect the vaccinated people, because it's not working as well as you thought it would, why would you mandate that either? Because it's not working. Why would you mandate something that doesn't work? So either way, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense to me just from, just from like a, like a one plus one equals two, like sort of thing, regardless sure. of how you feel like I so saw it works. Right. But just from a, that train of logic doesn't like. Somewhere it goes off and it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Like what? Like what's going on with with that? Because I would think there would be. All right. So Pfizer and Moderna are, have also said you need boosters. So like we talked mm -hmm. about earlier, that could help their bottom line. But mm -hmm. what's the thought process there, or do you know? 
Uh, I, I don't know. When we get into this, the, if you're asking me to peer into a politician's mind, it's like going to get real like cynical. From, <laughs> like, we, we talk, like we talked about um, before on the last time you were on about the, the science versus the public health sure. thing. So like from a public health sort of view, I guess, like what, mm-hmm. what's the thought process there if, if there is one? Also, if there's not one, because it actually makes no sense, feel free to say that too. But oh, sure. <laughs> if, you could, if you could say, this is why I think they're saying it this way, what would, mm-hmm. what would the reasoning behind that be? Sure. I mean, I, I sort of have two thoughts. We're, we're going to flesh this out live, so let's figure it out. Um, one of them is that there's an aspect that people, uh, population wants people to be doing something, right? Like they don't like the 50,000 number, right? Like when the CDC comes out and says there were 50,000 people who were vaccinated, who got COVID, um, people, their snap response, right? When they don't go back and do the back of the envelope math is something's wrong, do something, right? That's the, so I think there's an aspect of that, which is going, we got to do something, right? Because the voters are not happy. Let's do some things. Let's make sure we we are acting and we're we're getting things done. Um, I think there's an aspect of of panic to it, right? I think the messaging um, the messaging around the vaccines in like the past month has been horrible. It's been horrible. Yeah. But I mean, I don't understand. Like you said, I mean, hearing that, you know. I, the, the underlying message of a lot of these things is that the vaccine doesn't work, right? I mean, what, like you said, what, what does it say to somebody who's vaccine hesitant, right? And, um, and they hear that they have to get a vaccine, but even after they get the vaccine, they still have to mask, they still have to stay away from people, they might still get COVID. And in fact, we have to give you this thing because the people we already gave the thing to aren't protected. Right, like what yeah. the un- the underlying message there is that this doesn't work, um, especially if you're already primed to hear that. Mm-hmm. Right, if you're already listening for that, it's loud and clear. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, I sort of get a feeling of of panic, and we need somebody to do something. And these boosters, like, let's just give more. Let's give more of the stuff. Um, Israel started giving more, so let's do that. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that it, again, from a scientific perspective, I think we need to have a, you know, a frank discussion of what's our goal, right? Like, do we want less PCR positive swabs? Is that our end game or is it to prevent hospitalization and death? And are we trying to prevent the most death? Because if that's the case, there's a lot of the world that hasn't gotten their first dose, right? And like we said, one dose is 80% effective. I mean, the, you know, giving me a dose versus giving, you know, a healthcare worker in Bangladesh a dose is a no brainer, right? I've, I've had, you know, it's a glutton for me to take any more at this point, right? I had COVID, I got vaccinated mm. and I mean, it's- You're about as good as it gets. Right. I mean, that, you know, I've gone back to effectively normal life, um, but like give it, you know, forcing me to take a, a third one so that I can go to the movies- um yeah. is you know and like i said it's there's something deeply unethical about forcing me to take it when there's somebody who's at real risk um around the planet but i, I so i don't know that it matches the science right i i think we need to figure out so, you know science can tell you how things work but it can't give you goals yeah right so like what what's our goal here you know is it like we said is it to decrease the number of people who test positive or is it to stop death? Um, and I don't, I don't know that we've had that discussion. And I think it's, I do think, I mean, I think COVID's a very convenient political cudgel to, you know, to wield against your opponents. I think, you know, like, so for me, I think it's silly that, um, I, like, I, I, I think it's silly that states on sort of a statewide level are just snapping, you know, statewide, restrictions on things right yeah. so like I, I think it i think it doesn't make sense at the state level to force all school children to wear a mask i also think it doesn't make sense at a statewide level to force all school children to not wear a mask right like i don't think you know if you're it depends where you are and where the what the covid rates are like in your town and 
you know, what your kid's specific scenario is. And uh, there's a lot of like, a lot of things that go into it, but it's a lot easier just to go, you know, to, to take your, you know, to take your side and then, well, my team does this and your team does that. Um, and I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think we've deviated from the science pretty strong. I mean, these data are all the same. So I have on this sheet, which we, we can put together a thing, but I mean, I have the CDC, I have New York City has re- released their data. It's the same thing. Oh, you know? well, de Blasio is still in charge there. So that doesn't even count. <laughs> yeah, right. England, right? So England's got the same thing. They're all the same numbers, right? The VA did their own study, right? All of these things show protection against So it's everybody. Every data set I look at has the yeah. same message. Also, the speaking of England, aren't we on their red list? I don't think the U U the U S is allowed to try. That just seems. I. I don't. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. I surely that has to be a political thing because you would you would think or even just like a. Because I was talking to uh, somebody who spent a lot of time in Europe and their perception of us like the ones who haven't like the Europeans who haven't traveled here, they asked him, it was Will actually, um, <laughs> shameless oh, yeah. plug again, episode 38. Um, he was <laughs> like, he mentioned on there, they asked him if he had ever seen somebody get shot before. So like what they see on the news or like is people getting shot all the time. Like no mm-hmm. one wants to take vaccines and no one wants to like all of these things that just aren't true. So I don't, not that those things don't exist comment section for all one of you in there <laughs> but i don't i don't know it's just like for somebody like me right because i was trying to plan at some point to go over there to maybe like spend a week over there watch some soccer games like something like that now i'm just stuck so that sucks <laughs> yeah but i just i don't i don't know i would before i speculate more i would should go research the rationale of why but Mm-hmm. I don't know. It it just seems, it seems very odd, I guess. Yeah. And I'll kind of leave it at that. Like like I said earlier, I don't want to go too far down the. Like if we went down that rabbit hole, we would be here for forever. So. <laughs> yeah. True. Um. But yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't like like you said. I don't know. It makes no sense to me because. If you really want everyone to get vaccinated, you shouldn't be saying that the vaccine doesn't work because that just seems dumb like what you oh it right. works get it that's why you need to get more of it yeah like no i, I don't work so well you need more yeah i don't yeah, it just no. well and like, like you said i mean when I'm, they did I'm that did they think that. of it like did they think of that like hey maybe if we tell people it doesn't work so they have to get more they'll want to get more like no like i i don't think Um, I think this is sort of a, um, I don't think politicians are in the business of convincing people. I think they're in the business of in-group signaling, right? I think now, now anyways, yeah, fair enough, but right. Like, I I don't think, um, I'm very confused as to when public health decided that shame was an appropriate mechanism to convince people again. Like that really worked well in AIDS, right? That was a really positive way was to make people feel bad. Um, and, right, like we know this. We know mm-hmm. how to do this. We're choosing not to. That's what, right? That's what we're letting emotions get the best of us. Um, you know, I. So I. So I'll put it out there for me, right? So I think for most adults, it makes sense to get vaccinated. I think you don't really want to roll the dice. Um, you know, if people have questions and they want to talk over stuff, I'm happy to talk to you. I don't think you should be made to do things you don't want to do. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I think you own your own body and that's up to you. Um, I want you to make the best choice for you. But um, I think that message has gotten lost. And I I think people feel like the institutions don't have their best interest, right? Like they don't, they don't feel like they even like them. Um, I mean, even think of the fact, I mean, it's clear that they are avoiding the idea of discussing natural immunity at all costs. I mean, occasionally you'll get sort of a, a breakthrough, a breakthrough news story um, about it. 
but by all accounts, it's equal to, if not superior to getting vaccinated. Now, listen, I wouldn't tell people to go intentionally get infected. I don't think you need that level of protection, right? Like in the same way that if you want to learn to fight, I would not send you to the streets of Chicago to learn how to fight. You'll learn or you'll die, but yeah. it's not the appropriate way to go about it. But if you happened to run into it, then you're probably okay. And if you wanted to take a dose or two to boost your antibodies, that's fine too. Um, but we're super hesitant to talk about it. And we're not, you know, our, and none of these passport systems that we're discussing take it into account. And this just breeds distrust, right? Like, I, I don't know how to read it any other way. Um, right? Like, I, you know, I, I think it, it does. You want to be trusting of people. And it's, it's hard when every, all of, media society is like no you can't trust anybody because of xyz reasons mm -hmm. but if you guys do have questions for dr chris put them in the comments or message us on instagram i will get answers to you guys um he knows a lot of things <laughs> i'm putting that on a like a business card he knew, knows a lot of things yeah you can on your mug you can have i was wrong and then on the other side you can have i know a lot of things <laughs> and, and that'll be your that'll be your mug <laughs> I like it. But yeah, right. no, definitely. Happy to talk to people. All right. On to your book about clinical right. trials. So you mentioned clinical trials when you're talking about the vaccines. Yes. Give us a, the book is called. The book is called, let's pull it up here. What the heck is a clinical trial and where do I find one? Sounds good. So, what the heck is a clinical trial? Where do I find one? <laughs> so, so the goal of this book was to write a book for, um, for patients who find themselves getting um, in unexpected or I guess possibly expected, but a diagnosis of, um, of cancer in particular, though, though the, the information in this book would, would apply to other diseases as well. Um, but for a patient who finds himself in that particular scenario, um, I mean, they've just gotten thrown into a, a world, right? They're, you know, you're emotionally at a really rough spot, right? You've been given devastating news. Um, you are expected to sort of function in an arena that you're not comfortable in. And um, doctors are not the best communicators, generally. I've had some really good ones. Well, let's put the general asterisk, not all doctors. But on average, um, a lot of people feel like they get steamrolled by their doctor when they're in there. They don't know what questions to ask. They think of 50 questions after they leave. Um, and what the reason I find that this is, so I, I what, the, the thing that spawned me to write this was that I've had a number of conversations with people who got this diagnosis and then found it was easier to sort of chat with me for an hour rather than, um, you know, to prep them for their discussions with their doctors and, and have a conversation like this where they could learn a lot. Um, and so I started writing it and then doing some research and effectively what it is, is it's, um, I mean, it's exactly what the, the title says, right? It's, it's a primer on what clinical trials are and some basic terminology and concepts, and then how you go about finding one, um, because you can actually look yourself, which is something people don't know. Um, there's actually a website that, that lists all the registered clinical trials in the United States, uh, and you can search it with just like Google. Um, so the, the question that a lot of people ask when I sort of discuss this book is, is, well, I have my doctor, why don't I just ask them, right? Um, and it's a fair question. I think you should ask your doctor. Nothing in this book and nothing that we've talked about during this discussion should be taken as medical advice. It's not. Um, it's just a chance for I you I know to nothing. Don't listen to me. <laughs> I know things, but it's still not medical <laughs> advice or financial <laughs> advice. It's not advice at all. Um, so, yeah, so... The reason that I suggest people start to kind of think about it themselves is twofold. One, um, I want you as the patient to be able to understand what your doctor's offering you, right? Which is hard, right? I mean, anybody who's read any contract ever uh, knows that it can be hard to figure out all the details, especially if you're not versed in the arena. Um, and I want you to be able to consider alternative options, right? I mean, your doctor is working, you know, 50 hours a week. They know the clinical trials that are down the street because their friend Frank is recruiting somebody. Um, 
or they had a conversation with a drug rep and they think this trial is really cool, but they don't know what's going on at the hospital two blocks down or the one across the way or, or one in, if you drove an hour away. They, you know, there's no, it's not a, a dig on the doctors. It's just, that's, you know, that's human nature is you don't know everything that's going on everywhere. Um, and so part of the thing I wanted to do was sort of present these facts to people, right? And um, the whole book, in terms of how to pick a clinical trial, right? So there's, there's the obvious aspect, which is um, just sort of describing a lot of the different things, right? But the thing I wanted people to recognize is that um, there's something that they need to know specifically around the phase function. So there's, there's three phases, generally speaking, of clinical trials, right? There's phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, and for most patients, um, and for most people, they have no idea what those are, why they're that way. There just seems like you do one and then two and then three because that's numerical order. Um, but they're actually very different and they're designed to do different things. Um, and this translates into what your likelihood of getting benefit out of a clinical trial is. Um, so the first thing I like to point out to people is that uh, when, when patients are sort of concerned about clinical trials, they've had a lot of medical care at this point, but when people have surveyed them, but people, let me take a step back. When uh, people have surveyed patients who are on clinical trials, roughly 50% of them say that they found the clinical trial somewhat or much better than their previous clinical care. And, um, and 95 to 96% say they would do it again and recommend other patients consider this, right? It, it seems like it's generally a positive, um, it's a positive thing for patients. They, they're not, um, they don't find the treatment any worse than they were previously getting. Um, and in a lot of cases, they end up getting extra scans and extra, uh, extra monitoring because they're, you know, the, the, they're getting watched a little more closely. Well, they have to do the research on whether or not it's working more closely than something that's so the data is already there. Yep. And also that those people are more likely, I'll say, maybe not more likely, but they're more, they're more, I would say, welcoming of somebody who might be willing to take their new mm -hmm. yep. insert treatment here uh, rather than a standard one. They have more incentive to keep you in. Yep, exactly. And, um, and the, the benefits are pretty good. Um, so the, uh, for the vast, vast, vast majority of patients um, going on a clinical trial, the medical bills are covered by the pharmaceutical company. Um, so it's also something for people if you're in kind of dire straits, um, it's something to consider. You know, it, when you're thinking about your clinical trials that, that finances won't prevent you from getting a treatment in this arena. Um, Very good news. Yeah. And actually there's a ton of them around. So that's the other thing people don't know. Um, so as of 2020, when I looked this up on the clinical trials website, um, only one state, which was Wyoming, had less than 100 clinical trials recruiting cancer patients. Um, like they were looking for actively looking for patients. And even Wyoming had 93. Well, right. So it's no one's there. So <laughs> yeah, they, they're recruiting from other states. Um, but yeah, so like there's, there's at least a hundred clinical trials just floating around in your state, right? And that, you know, unless you're in one of the giant states, you know, we're talking a couple, you know, a couple hours to drive to any given corner. Yeah. Um, I mean, as a, as a number I throw around to people, um, there's roughly, again, this was this December, 2020 number. Um, but there were roughly the same number of recruiting clinical trials for cancer as there are Burger Kings. So if you can think of how many Burger Kings, you know, infinite, that's, <laughs> there's, there's that many cancer clinical trials that were recruiting patients already. Um, so the thing, the real crux of this book is about the phases and it's really an explanation of what they are. And I think that would benefit if you only take one thing away, it's an understanding of what these phases are. And I think the moment I explain them to you, you'll understand how this affects a patient considering different trials, right? So in the book, I break them down into questions because, mm -hmm. you know, a good experiment is a question, right? Um, so phase one is asking a very particular question. And the question that it's asking is, is this thing even safe, right? That's it. They're, they're not, 
if you happen to get the drug to work a little bit and make somebody better, that's cool. But we're in phase one, you're just trying to figure out, is this thing safe? Is it going to start killing people? What dose can you give it at? Do people start to get sick? Right? You're, you're starting, you do typically what's called a dose escalation. So you give a very low dose to somebody and then the next person you give a little bit more and then the next person you give a little bit more um, and you keep going until you reach you know, the top of your plan or you hit toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if you're considering a phase one trial, right, you might not even get dosed correctly, right? I mean, there's a chance that you got something that was too much. You could have gotten something that was too low. Um, you know, I, the odds are against you really getting the right dose, even if it yeah. was to work. Um, and that's even assuming that the drug is going to work, right? I mean, the, the roughly, I mean, that last time I checked, it's roughly 3% of phase one clinical trials eventually lead to approval, right? So 97% of them don't make it to being an approved drug. Um, Not so, great. No. <laughs> and so, I mean, phase ones will do some other things. They'll do things called dose expansion cohorts. So they'll, um, they'll find a dose they like, and then they'll test it on a small group of patients just to make sure that that dose was the right dose going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're a patient and you have a phase one trial in front of you and you have a phase three trial in front of you, it almost doesn't matter what the phase three is. You should take it, right? Yeah. It's, it's immaterial of the medicine. Um, and this is sort of another point I make in the book, which is can't give too much away. People got to read it. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Well, let's keep going through the phases, right? <clears throat> so phase two is a question of whether or not the drug works. Right? Mm -hmm. So then you start to assess whether you can make diseases better. In the, in the case of cancer, can you slow down cancer growth? Um, you also enroll a lot more patients. So you start to look for rare side effects, right? So a, the typical phase one can be anywhere from like 10 to 50 patients. And so if there's a, you know, a side effect that happens in 1% you know, of the population, you may get zero you know, at yeah. 50 people, none, nobody might, sh you know, may show that. Um, so at phase two, you, you enroll more people, you stick with the dose that you picked in phase one. Um, you sometimes start to restrict which diseases are there uh, or, or that you're testing it on. Um, you know, like I'm only going to look at lung cancer now or only melanoma. Mm -hmm. um, and you start to see if it works. And then if that goes well, then you move on to phase three where you're asking, you know, are you sure this thing works and is it better than something else that's on the tape, right? So you're asking, you know, if you, th that's the randomized, you know, the randomized clinical trial that everybody kind of understands um, where you take two groups of patients, you split them randomly, right? And one of them you give the, what's considered the standard of care, right? Mm -hmm. So what this disease would normally get and the other one you give your new drug and you see who does better. Um, so as you, I mean, even just from those descriptions, it's pretty clear which phase you want to be in if you're a patient. Phase um, three, all mm -hmm. day. Right? <laughs> and, you know, like some patients may not have that option. I mean, there's, so the other thing we, we discussed in the book are eligibility criteria. Mm -hmm. So the clinical trials will set the rules for who can, um, who can enroll. Um, and so for some patients who have certain things, like, you know, if you happen to have a brain metastasis, that excludes you from a lot of trials, um, but not a phase one, right? So, you know, for those patients, a phase one might be your only option. Um, gotcha. So that, you know, like that's kind of how it breaks down. Yeah. So that's, Sounds I mean, that's good. basic. Yeah. And this should be out this fall, winter, winter, fall. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's go winter. The winter I have it here. Of this this year. is the manuscript. It's mostly done. I found a typo, but it's almost done. Um, there you go. We've got the manuscript ready to go. Needs to add some comics in there to make it yep. fun. I'm going to lighten it up. I should give a shout out to my, uh, my brother-in-law who's doing the comics for me, Brian yeah. Barthelmus. He, uh, you can find him on Instagram, um, but he also was the, the uh, backup center for the Patriots for a while. Uh, and nice. then he was the lead singer in a folk band, Tallahassee. And now he owns a tattoo shop in, um, up in Vermont. So his Instagram's always super interesting. 
So he Sounds also does like he's lived a full life. Shout out to Brian. Yeah, we'll put yeah. his Instagram in the description for sure. Yeah, so that's it. And then the like the last part of the book is just talking about how you know if you're a patient and you want to look, um, it gives you a way to look, right? So it walks you through the website, how to search, you know what what ways you want to, um, you know, what kind of questions you want to ask um, and how to get to the best clinical trial for you. And then, you know, that way you go into your doctor with a list of two or three trials that you like that are, you know, fingers crossed phase three, they might be a little bit further away um, than your local hospital, but you know, it's something for you to, it gives you something to, to focus your discussion with your doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, if you're still listening to this point, which I know most of you are not. Thank you, YouTube Analytics, but that's okay. If you are, <laughs> please share the book, right? If you know anyone who is potentially in this situation, right? If you've got questions, comments, whatever, let me know. I will get them to Dr. Chris. We will try and help you out. I know uh, Chris is, as much as myself, just in the business of trying to help people have better lives. So anything that we can do to help, just let us know. Um, and yeah, it's been great having you on. Appreciate all the information. Learned tons of stuff today. Uh, hopefully somebody will drop the ca- Constitution of Liechtenstein in the comments. If you don't, <laughs> I'm disappointed in all of you. <laughs> uh, uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. It's been great. I, I learned a ton. Uh, thanks for having me, man. This was a blast. Of course. It's always good to get, we'll have to get Katie and Tom on individually as well. It's always good to have you guys bounce ideas off each other, but at the same time to go into stuff that maybe you, you're more passionate about the book, right? Is something that mm-hmm. you're more into. It's always good to hear your guys' individual things that you got going on as well. Definitely. With that, we'll wrap this up and we'll see you guys later. Peace. <laughs>